on Friday night. As we all know, he's been uh, with cancer, and it just he lost his battle in about 7.30 on, on Friday night. So they're going to have a memorial service next Saturday at Turlock. And so the sign-up sheet that we're passing around, they're wanting to have 20 desserts from New Hope to be able to take up there. And they need them by Friday at 5 o'clock. So we're going to be passing that around. Yes, that would be great. Um, and people can sign up for that. We'd really appreciate it. We have lots going on this next week. It's almost like school started up and everything else at New Hope is starting up. We're having Bible studies that are starting up, and you can read your bulletin for that. We have the senior luncheon that's going to be this Tuesday, and I really encourage it. It's a fun group of people. It's a potluck. If you're new and haven't done it before, you don't have to bring anything. You can just come and eat, which is really good, and it's just we're going to have some games and fellowship this week. Jean also has... For the men's quarterly breakfast is going to be next Saturday. That's going to have a guest speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Lorenzo, Lorenzo Rios. Thank you, Jean. And he was the former head of the ROTC program at Fresno State, and he's the new CEO of the Clovis Veterans Memorial um, District. And we know that they do a lot of great stuff and have a lot of events there. So you won't want to miss out on that as well. We have the women's Bible study that's going to start, the 12 women of the Bible. And they're actually going to do something new this year. They're going to have, on the Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, they're both going to do the same Bible study. So that way women can have a chance to kind of talk about it. So I think that's a fun thing that's going to happen. The Jam Center. We're going to start the Jam Sessions on Wednesday night from 7 to 8. So if you have a friend or a neighbor, your kids, you want to do that, that's great. There's going to be an adult Bible study with Pastor Nick that's going to be going on at the same time. He has some sign-ups at the pavilion if you want to go out there. It's called Foundations. And so that way you can drop your kids off at the Jam Center and be able to enjoy the adult Bible study and, and be good. Bunko's going to be coming up the 19th. We have 80 people that signed up, so I think we're a full house for that, so we're excited. We also have some fun things with a family night, skate night, and that's in the bulletin as well. So I'll have you encourage you to read that. Right now we're going to call our ushers for the tithes and offering, and we're going to pray. But before I do that, the biggest thing, you've been watching the uh, Fresno Rescue Mission video that's been running. We're going to have a sign-up sheet for that as well. And as Pastor Tim always tells us, it's better to serve than to receive, right? And so we can, as a church family, if you can't go to Mexico or to Africa, we can sure do this. And the handout that the ushers gave you tells about the two-day event that we're going to have there on October 2nd and 3rd. So please sign up. It's going to be an overnight event. It's $25 a person. That includes four meals in the overnight. And we have, I think they do 113 in the dormitory, and then they do 200 outside camping. And it's a big brick wall that surrounds it. So it's a safe place. It's going to be fun as well. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for being all that we need, for giving us comfort, and showing that in your word, you're all sufficient. But we want to hold up some of our New Hope family. Pastor Tim, to continue to give him strength so that he can return and be with us. And dear Lord Shelley, she has such a strong faith, but she has been on a roller coaster this last month, caring for her, for her dad and train, going back and forth to Turlock taking care of Tim, and then coming into the office and making sure that New Hope's running smoothly. And we also want to hold up the Fish family. Tim just found out with Joe and Karen Fish that Karen's father just went into hospice. So Lord, surround their family and give them comfort in what they're going through right now. And dear Lord, I hope that you put on folks' hearts that are here today to be a part of this mission at the Fresno Rescue Mission. It's a way that we can show the light to serve our local community 
and also gain strength in our fellowship with one another. And Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful weather that you've been giving us. Please let everyone slow down a little bit today and take in the glory and the beauty of your creation. Sometimes in the hustle and bustle, we just forget to, to take a moment to breathe. Please allow us to do that today. And thank you, God, for just loving us so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased and happy to be able to introduce Corey, who everybody knows who Corey is. But she's been here forever. But I think we're so blessed when she's, when she's able to preach to us because she always speaks from the heart. And I told her this morning, she's so authentic. And the emotion's there, and I feel like that she's just speaking from a place of authenticity, which is very refreshing and kind of like, how do you, how do you live life? How do you apply it? She's been the children's director a ministry for New Hope. She's been the director of junior high, surf, high school, college. She's been the wedding coordinator at New Hope. And now she and Teddy share the helm over the small groups. And I know for, how many people are in small groups or in a small group? Raise your hand. There's about 200 of us that are doing it. And I know I've been blessed a lot with our small group. And she's going to bless us with her message today. So Corey. for that introduction. Um, I think that many of the music people have stepped out, but I, it looked effortless and it was not effortless. And I'm so grateful for um, the music and Milo and Randy and Bethany and Kendall. Thank you. When um, I did not know that they were going to do uh, In Christ Alone. Milo gets odd texts at odd times for me and because I'll be like driving to work and I'll hear a song and then I'll get in the parking lot and I'm like having a moment and then I'll text Milo like at 6.45 or 7 in the morning, hey, I love this song. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and so, so I, he, yeah, he scrambled this week to make things happen. So I appreciate that. And um, when I am really loud, but can you all hear me okay? Um, so um, when I was asked to share with you guys today, I immediately thought this might be my chance uh, to rope my sister and Kendall into singing a song. So I did. I totally used it to my advantage. And um, I really, really wanted Overwhelmed. Uh, it it's a song that I can remember very vividly, this experience of I was going to winter camp at Hume Lake as a counselor, and um, I was tired. It's winter camp. I had been working and going to school and all of that, and I show up to try to give junior hires my best, right? And I, I walk in, and they've got this big sign that says, overwhelmed, and I was like, yes, God, you, you know exactly how I'm showing up today, and you know exactly what's going on in my world. And then they sang that song. And I just, it hit my heart that I realized I was overwhelmed by all the wrong things. That God had called me to be overwhelmed by him and by his mercy and by his sacrifice. And so while I was watching other people's junior hires, God and I worked through that. That's the, the benefit of being camp counselor. Um, so then, as God would have it, when... Um, when I decided that was kind of where we would start today, it's been an interesting couple of weeks for me. Um, I tried constantly to not say I was overwhelmed, right? I kept using other descriptive language. I'm very busy. There's, there's more than I'm used to handling, or I'm just, I'm all full up here. I just, I could not, I didn't want to say I'm freaking out and I'm overwhelmed because I knew I was going to be talking Sunday. And then, um, I was inspired to find a, an old prayer journal that I have after watching The War Room. And um, I opened up to, this is a, the Traveling Light Journal uh, by Max Lucado. And I'd been spending my week trying to pretend that I was not overwhelmed by my circumstances so that I could show up today and be able to say, let's be overwhelmed by Jesus. But the truth was, I've spent the week a little overwhelmed by my circumstances. And this is what I read. The verse is Luke twenty-two forty-two. 42. 
Father, if you are willing, take away this cup of suffering, but do what you want, not what I want. And this is referring to Jesus in the garden before his crucifixion. How did Jesus endure the terror of the crucifixion? He went first to the Father with his fears. He modeled the words of Psalm 56.3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Do the same with yours. Don't avoid life's gardens of Gethsemane. Enter them. Just don't enter them alone. And while there, be honest. Pounding the ground is permitted. Tears are allowed. And if you sweat blood, you won't be the first. Do what Jesus did. Open your heart. And be specific. Jesus was. Take this cup, he prayed. Give God the number of the flight. Tell him the length of the speech. Share the details of the job transfer. He has plenty of time. He also has plenty of compassion. He doesn't think your fears are foolish or silly. He won't tell you to buck up or get tough. He's been where you are. He knows how you feel. And I was encouraged that I was allowed to be overwhelmed. It was just, what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? And um, I don't know how you came here today. I don't know if you are overwhelmed by your circumstances, if you are overwhelmed by fear or guilt or anger or grief. And I don't know if it's keeping you stuck and distant from God, but that's not what he has planned for us. So as, so what does then being overwhelmed mean? We're going to get there. But as a teacher, as an educator, we know that when we're teaching, we're supposed to talk about what we're going to be talking about. That was what I just did. And then we give examples. And then we give what's called, you can also give what's called a non-example, right? So this is what we're doing. This is what it looks like. This is not what it looks like. So again, I don't know how you came here today. Maybe you are overwhelmed by circumstances. Or maybe you are very, very comfortable. Let me pray for you and let's see what God has for us today. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for your word. And I pray that you would um, teach us your word. I pray that you would prepare us for what you have for us. I thank you that we can um, receive your peace. That in the midst of trials, in the midst of our burdens, you are there. And you've said, give them to me. I can, bring, I can give you peace. And we pray for your peace, Lord. I pray for those of us who know that it's time to take a step out, but we're afraid. We're comfortable where we are. We know what to expect, and we're just afraid of that next step. And I trust that you will give us the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that we don't belong on either end of the spectrum, right? Overwhelmed by our circumstances to where we're not able to, to step out and then also so comfortable that we know what to expect every minute. And I know that because there's verses that say, fear not, cast all your cares on him, be anxious for nothing. John 16, says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. So I was reading um, in the book of John. I'm going to be in John chapter 6. And I'm going to read quite a bit. But I figured if I said I read a lot of the Bible today, I wouldn't get in too much trouble. So we're going to be in John chapter 6, starting in verse 27. Or 26, I'm sorry. So at the, to give you a little bit of background, at this point, Jesus has done some really, really cool things. And he's gonna, he, we're talking about the disciples, which are not just the 12. These are the followers, the people who have been learning from Jesus, following Jesus. And Jesus has been doing some pretty cool things. He's fed the 5,000. He's walked on water. He's healed people. So people are following him to see all of this. 
to know more. Who's this guy? And, and, he's, he, and he's doing all of these amazing things. I also kind of love this passage again as a teacher. There's this saying that you haven't taught it until the students have learned it, right? Which is a valid saying if you're a teacher, right? If you haven't gotten it, then I must not have really taught it. But we all know there have been those moments where you have taught it, you have shown them, maybe your own children like tying their shoes, you've shown them, you sang a song, you modeled it, you did it together, and then you did all of that over and over again, and then they still go, huh, right? We've all had that moment, and I kind of feel like Jesus is having one of those moments. He has said this, he has shown them, he has brought them along into this conversation, and the followers are still going, what? What? And I just, like, when I get to heaven, if they do instant replay or, like, home videos, I want to watch this whole moment unfold with Jesus telling them some of this stuff and them just staring at him very confused, which I would have been too, and and you'll see where we go with this. So starting in verse 26, they have found Jesus, and they ask him, where have you, how'd you get over here? And he says, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You're coming back to me for more. Your stomachs got filled and you're coming back for more. Let's be real. Do not work for food that spoils. So he starts to plant that seed and tell them, I've got more for you than that meal that we just ate. Don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. At this moment, these these disciples, these followers, are very focused on what's happening right here and now. The miracles, the having their stomachs filled. And Jesus says, I'm ready to take this conversation up a notch. We're talking about eternity. I'm your answer to eternity. Set your minds on eternity. And they say, okay, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Which, that's one of those questions that you say, I'm sorry, is that what we were talking about? It's kind of an off-topic question. That's not what we were talking about. He's saying, I'm the giver of eternal life. And he says, and they say, how do we do the works that God requires? And so then he says, The work of God is this. Let me be clear. The work of God is this. Believe in the one he has sent. Come back into this conversation, people. Believe in me. And they say, okay, well, what miraculous signs will then you give us that we can see and believe you? What will you do? He had just, that's why they were there in the first place, right? They had just seen him do those things. And so then now they're asking for it again. And they said, our forefathers ate manna. And that was pretty cool. You know, that's how God showed that he was sustaining them day by day. Is they got to walk out of their tents and there was food just sitting there for them. Now, we all know that those same people also complained that there wasn't enough meat, right? Like, thanks for the manna, where's the meat, God? But they're going back to, uh, we want what our forefathers had. This is what you did for, for my forefathers. Do something like that for us. Show us that you're real. He gave them the bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. He's now said this a couple of times. I tell you the truth. Believe me. It is not Moses who has given you the bread of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of heaven he is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, okay, well, give us that bread. We want that bread. That sounds better. And he says, I'm the bread. I I want to see their faces when he says, all right, I'm the bread. We're talking about me. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. 
For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him. He's being very direct. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then they get a little distracted. Wait, he just said he's the bread from heaven. Isn't this the son of Joseph and Mary? I don't get it. I don't think this is right. How can he say he's bread from heaven? And Jesus says, stop grumbling amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. I'm talking about eternity. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert and yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, as this conversation continues, we read it and we know what's coming right? We know about the the Last Supper. We know that Jesus starts to explain this a little bit more as he breaks bread and says, eat this bread, it's my body. Drink this wine, it's my blood. This hasn't happened yet, so I kind of get why the followers are a little confused or taken aback by what he's saying. But really, it's clear by the repetition that Jesus is giving that this is not what the people are looking for. They're there to watch Jesus do something cool, right? We're kind of at the, these people up to this point have been dating Jesus. And let's all admit, dating is fun, right? The, The dinners are usually better. When my husband would come to pick me up for our dates before we got married, the car was clean. The truck, the truck door would open and it was sparkly and it smelled good. Now, now I know that 10 minutes before he picked me up for those dates, it was not clean, nor did it smell good. That's the cost of dating a football coach, right? Like there's all sorts of stuff in there that doesn't smell good. Dating, you also kind of get to keep a little bit of that independence, right? So when we were dating, at about 9.30, 10, you know, we would have gone to dinner or whatever, and then he'd say, gosh, I'm, I'm tired. And I'd think, oh, thank God. I'm tired too. Like, this is past my bedtime. I go to bed early. That's awesome. We're on the same schedule. That is cool. So then he'd take me home, and I would go to sleep and think, this is great. And then now I know... He was not tired, he was totally bored, and he does not go, I've never known him to go to bed at 9.30 or 10, right? He went home and played video games or went on the computer or did whatever he did, but he certainly did not go home and go to sleep. But when you're dating, you get to maintain some of that level of independence, right? So right now, the followers of Jesus are dating him. They're there when it's good, right? Those answered prayers, the miracles, when he's showing up and doing cool things, that's what they're interested in. And he's telling them, I've got something more for you. So then he goes on to say, where was I? Verse 52. They're saying, how is he going to, this flesh, I don't like this conversation, right? They're kind of, they're appalled at the, he says, we're going to eat his flesh. Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And he says, I tell you the truth. I get you might not like it, but I've said this like eight times. I'm telling you the truth. 
Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him, just as the living Father sent me. And I live because of the Father." So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. In case you didn't hear me the first time, he said. He probably didn't say that. I, I don't know if Jesus rolls his eyes, but I probably would have rolled. Like I, Jesus says, I'm not interested in dating. I, we're all in, consumed. I want you to be consumed by me. And what is the difference between dating Jesus and being the bride of Christ? Well, we see a picture of that in uh, Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, and they will, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. He's saying that's what I'm talking about. You being presented as the bride of Christ for eternity where we are consumed with one another. We are all in and you experience the fullness of my blessing, not just daily manna. And they think about this. And in verse 60, back in John chapter 6, verse 60, it says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is hard teaching. Who can accept this? This is hard. So then he goes on to say, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who still do not believe. You're just here for the good stuff. Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They said, I, this is too hard. So then Jesus turns to hit the 12 that are there and he says, well... You do not want to leave too, do you? And I love Peter's response. He doesn't like say, oh yeah, I totally get it. It's awesome. I am on board. Like, let's start eating some flesh, you know, like Jesus, I get it. I get it totally. I, I, I got you. No, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Jesus says, are you guys going to leave too? And he says, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else are we going to go? I may not completely understand or like or get everything you're saying, but I believe that you are the Holy One. You are talking about eternity. Where else am I going to go? I had a, a little bit of experience with this for myself when Jesus said, are you going to leave too? Um, when I was about to turn 17, um, I was actually planning uh, my baptism at the Mormon church for my 17th birthday. And uh, my parents weren't quite sure what to do about that. So a coworker of my mom's knew Tim from high school and my mom called the church and I got an appointment with the youth pastor, which I didn't want to do any of those. So the whole conversation started with me wanting to plan this baptism date on my birthday um, at the Mormon church, but I agreed to have this meeting in what used to be an office over here. And 
the youth pastor at the time had a lot of information about the Mormon church, but we didn't even talk about it. Because I had shared with him that I had accepted Jesus as my savior. I believed the Bible. So he read a couple of verses and then he just looked at me and said, who do you believe Jesus is? And how do you believe you're saved? And I'm kind of a proud person, so I just sat there. I didn't answer his question. But I knew the answer. I knew that my answer was, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's part of the Holy Trinity. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross once for all sin and that I'm saved by grace, not by works which are two important determining factors of whether or not you're going to join the Mormon church or not. So I just sat there. Because for me, that reality was hard. Of course, nothing like our persecuted brothers and sisters all over the world, right? But for this 17-year-old Buchanan High School student, the struggle was real, right? This meant changing how I lived my entire life. I started to come here. I didn't want to. I went to winter camp and celebrated my 17th birthday with people I barely knew. I uh, got up one morning and I'm looking in the mirror and brushing my teeth and I can see two girls standing behind me in the mirror. Like, they, they must not have known that I could see them. They're in the mirror behind me and they're talking and they're saying, I don't think she wants to be here. I must not have been very pleasant. <laughs> and so, Because I didn't want to be there. And if you know me, I, I, I can only be me is really all I can be. I, you can read me pretty quickly. But um, they're talking about me, not rude. I mean, they were being compassionate. It was just kind of awkward. Like, I'm in there. I don't know. I don't think she wants to be here either. Like, she really does not. And they're having this whole conversation behind me. But it was the truth. I did not want to be there. I did not want to be there with them. I wanted to be elsewhere with my friends, my friends who were on peach and alluvial. They were on uh, knees and peach. I had to change my life because when Jesus turned to me and said, you do not want to leave too, do you? My only response could be, where am I supposed to go? You have the words of eternal life, and I believe that you are the Holy One of God. And so I continue to come here, and now you guys can't get rid of me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I do not know how you came here today. I don't know if you came comfortable, loving the, the world that you're in, but you know God's pushing you to first grade if you're living in kindergarten. He's ready to push you. He does not want you to stay in first grade forever. He has something for you. Or maybe you are overwhelmed by life circumstances and he says, take heart. I have peace. I am here with you. I don't know how you came here today, but I know that he is in control of those things and that if you are willing to look to him and say, where else am I supposed to go? I believe you are who you said you are. Let's do this. He'll help you through the hard stuff. And then that leads to my segue of small groups because we knew I'd get there, right? <laughs> so the reason for small groups, we talk about connect, grow, reach, and serve, right? We're not to do life alone. I was listening to a speaker and he said the first small group was the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit together, right? They're the first small group. And then we see Adam. Adam and his animals were not enough. Even if it's dog, Facebook, Friday, or whatever, your animal is not enough. God gave Adam Eve, and then we see the 12 disciples brought together. They didn't, Peter wasn't expected to figure this all out on his own. They had each other. And so why small groups? So that we can connect with each other, so that we can grow deeper in the word and share the hard stuff with each other. I don't get this. I don't like this. What are we supposed to do about it? Have those conversations and dig deeper with one another, and then have that courage to reach out to others and serve others. 
So if it's not through small groups, I do encourage you to find that community. Because sometimes it's hard. And other times we're really, really comfortable. And it's time to, for it to get a little hard. <laughs> time to take that risk of first grade where you might be a little wrong sometimes. Let me pray and then we'll send you out in your boldness. Lord, thank you that we could come together and I just pray for your truth. I pray that our hearts would hear your spirit and that you would speak to us what truth you have for us. You say over and over again that you are the truth. And I pray that you would confirm that in our hearts, Lord, and give us the boldness to trust you and to follow you and to believe in you and to share that with others. We praise you and you thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen.